Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Scope Principle presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of scope that govern the operation of God's laws gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 6th of November 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, we're running about 10 minutes late, so this afternoon is probably going to finish about 10 minutes late, depending on how you go with this presentation. <laughs> now, most people who have this presentation who have ever presented this presentation to in the past, and it's only been in the spirit world, by the way, um, have, have struggled with it. So, <laughs> so don't be surprised if you struggle with it. Um, I'll try to give some examples, in particular one example I'll try to give, um, which will try to illustrate it graphically on the board for you in a way that you can understand, and that way we can hopefully get some grasp of what scope principles are all about. So this discussion, obviously, scope principles. And we'd first like to, as we did with all the other principles, give you a summary. But before the summary comes some terms, because the summary is so, is so complex that we had to make a whole heap of terms that you could understand first so that we could make a short summary because it involves a lot of terms. <laughs> so let's have a look at some of the terms. Now, these are t definitions that we're going to be using later in the group too, so you can carry them forward. But uh, let's look at the term creation. So what, when we ever term the, use the term creation in the scope principles, what we're referring to is any matter or creature from the smallest particles, the infinitesimally small particle, right up to the com most complex living creation, obviously the human soul. So we're talking about anything in between. That, by the way, the universe isn't as as complex as the human soul. So, so the human soul is the most complex creation. Energy includes information, energy, emotion, thought, communication, relationship, or interplay that occurs between creations. All right, it's a flow, or or it can also be within the creation itself. The flow that occurs within the creation. Properties include all the properties, characteristics, attributes and attractions and restrictions of the creation itself. So the creation itself has a whole heap of properties. It, 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 to illustrate that, you have eyes. Now those eyes have properties. Some of your eyes have a property that makes them brown. Other ones have a property that makes them blue. Does that make sense? We, we're terming that as a property. The eye itself is a property of the body. Right? The body itself is a property of the spirit body, and the spirit body is a property of the soul. So you, basically, you can see that everything has properties and subsets of properties and so forth, and you could drill down through the properties. Inbuilt rules means a set of laws and potentials built into the creation that govern the creation's properties and the energy. So it's a set of inbuilt rules inside of the creation itself. And we'll give some uh, examples of that later. And external rules means a set of laws and potentials created by creation combinations that are external to the creation we're looking at. So if we're looking at you as a person, there's things around you. There's the air around you that you breathe, for example. Well, that has all been created through, ha that has different combined properties. Your atmosphere that you're in, gravity and all these other uh, fluid dynamics and all these other atmospheres that we have around us, they're all got their own properties and they interact with us. And some of those things are necessary for the physical body's survival. In other words, we breathe them in. And we separate the oxygen from them that gets then pumped into the bloodstream, for example. And our lungs do that job, right? And, and in, the, in the process, the oxygen now is flowing around the, lung, the, the bloodstream, and now the oxygen oxygenates certain parts of our bodies through the cellular system and so forth. So the cardiovascular system, the cellular systems, they are all sub-properties of the human body. 
So you can see that external rules obviously are needed to say, well, what, what is the property of oxygen that allows it to actually be assimilated by a body and then allows it to be assimilated into the bloodstream and then allows it to be pumped into a cell structure to oxidate the cell, the cell, the living life form, if you like. And how does oxygen relate to life? There must be some relationships there because you take oxygen away and bang, you're dead. Right? So there's got to be relationships to all of these things and the external rules govern those relationships of the properties of those things that can be absorbed internally. You follow so far? Yep. So, how does it look, scope principles? Well, go scope principles guarantee creation is governed by law and that new creations and laws can exist. And when I say new creations and laws, it's interesting, the, the laws themselves exist through the potential of the principles anyway, and through higher laws. So, so new laws can come into existence, but only because there are already a whole set of governing laws that allow new laws to come into existence. In other words, there has to be a framework that it comes into existence by. And this is how it does it. Inbuilt rules are included in each creation. So for the human body, as an example, you have genetic system, which is a chain, a chain of very, very small combinations of very small particles and elements and, and, and matter that is all put together to create a code, which is like a programming code for your body. And that programming code is a very long chain. I think it wraps around the Earth or goes from the Earth to the Moon something like 20 times or something if you had to ex extend it all out. It's a very, very long chain. But it, the reality is, is, is that it's all combined within each cell structure and, and in fact the very the commingling of the first two cells, the egg and the sperm, causes this chain to come into existence and, and it actually, during that first phase of the assimilation of, both, of, the, of the sperm by the egg, it actually, there's actually a commingling that occurs in this chain. And this chain then becomes the program, programmed way you are going to look. Right? And when I say you are going to look, I don't mean your soul, because that is the real you. I just mean the body you're using at the moment. Right? And, and the body you're using is not the real you. But the inbuilt rule determines, these inbuilt rules determine what that body is now capable of and what kind of energy can flow into that body and out of that body and what the potentials of that body have now. So the human body is, has limited physical body, has limited potentials. You, you can't take it into outer space because it needs some external things like oxygen and other things like water and so forth to exist. And it has temperature uh, differentials that uh, it can handle. So if you get too hot, it, it, you'll die. If you get too cold, you'll die. So there's all these restrictions that are placed on the body through the law. And these laws are inbuilt in the creation itself. Does that make sense? And this is why things like a cockroach can handle higher temperatures or lower temperatures than a human can handle. Because they're built differently, they have different laws, therefore they can handle different temperatures. That's just an example. Inbuilt rules determine the creation's potentials, energy flow and properties. So, so as we can see, the creation now has the potential to do things and it does do things and it has energy flow that is capable of ha handling and it has properties like, you know, you could say to a large extent like ears are a property of the body eyes are a property of the body and then if you drill down even further a cell is a property of the body and so forth. So they're all different properties, some of which are larger than others and we'll talk about how they're created. En external rules affect the creation's properties and energy. So there are external rules that govern what happens internally and that is a function of the sum total of the creations that are outside of the body, in our case for the human body, affecting the body. And we can, we'll see how that happens. Then there's external rules that allow for the expansion of each creation's property and energy. So in other words, <coughs> there's rules externally, and also there are some internally as well, actually, that allow for the expansion of cap capacity. And these rules are already set in motion. They're already there. They, they just have to be engaged in some way in order for something new to occur. 
but they are already there. Oops. And external rules allow for new laws and new and creations. So every time there's a new creation, obviously there has to be a law that governs that creation, so naturally a new law must also exist when a new creation comes into existence. But how the new law comes into existence is controlled by the scope principles, and that is by the sum total of all the other laws in the way that they are mixed together as to how the new law gets created. And we'll talk about that a bit. Um, sorry. External rules control the flow of energy between creations. So, so my ability to talk to you, for example, is governed by, you know, there's many things it's governed by, but, but one of the things it's governed by is an atmosphere. If we weren't in an atmosphere, y you would not hear any sound vibrations, and therefore I'd be and you'd not hear anything, right? Because, because the external rules do govern what, what I'm able to say or how I'm, I'm able to communicate with you if I use my voice. Now, obviously, there's a different set of rules that determine my communication emotionally. So the reality is I could be going... <laughs> and you might see that I'm angry, right? And you might feel that, because that doesn't require an atmosphere to actually communicate that to you. You follow me? So you can not hear something but still communicate. So there's all sorts of ways that uh, different things are controlled by allowing the flow of energy and the types of energy that can be flow, uh, that can flow between creations. So, so what we're used to in the physical sense is we're used to physical sound, physical touch, physical you know, sight and so forth. But in the spirit body, yeah, um, it's an extension of those things. Obviously, there's more of those things. There's a larger, for example, we only see a certain spectrum of light here in, in through our eyes, but the spirit body has the ability to see a different, sp a complete spectrum of light. Does that make sense? And the soul has a, has the, uh, but not a complete in terms of the soul experience. The soul has the has the ability to experience all light, of all different spectrums, whereas the spirit body still has limitations. So each new, each portion of the human creation has limitations that are not experienced in the higher portion of the human creation, and the same applies for animals and other creations as well. All right, so it all sounds pretty complicated, right? Yep. Let's try and simplify it a little in terms of how this looks as an example. Now what I'm going to do is skip over our gravity examples and our aerodynamics example. Uh, I think they're pretty plain. Both of them are not single laws. They are actually many, many thousands of laws all combined together in a certain way to create a single law. So, you, you know, we need to understand. We need to understand that and we'll understand that through the diagram that I'd like to draw. The thing I'd like to talk about is the human bodies and I've you notice all the way through the outline I've used the term human bodies. And the reason why is because I'm not talking about you and I of having bodies, I'm saying that our, our physical body and our spirit body have similar ways of doing things. So this is what it looks like. So one of the main constituents of the human body is what? Water. So let's, uh, so let's do our water. There's a hydrogen and there's an oxygen. Right. Hydrogen and oxygen combine together in the form of two of those and one of those, don't they? Right. Now, oxygen by itself has a, has a set of inbuilt rules, and it's actually made up of other particles smaller than itself that make up that, that determine those rules. Right. But let's start at the elemental level here because if we can drill down infinitesimally small, can't we? Just like we could go up infinitesimal and be big. And, and what I'm doing is trying to just get a little subset of that out so we can explain how that works. But, so we've got oxygen, has properties. It has a certain number of what we have identified as humans, as electrons, protons and neutrons, but that's a very simplistic way of seeing it because it's actually made up of much more complicated particles than that. And even those protons, neutrons and electrons that we think we see are actually made up of very complicated subatomic particles as well. But let's start at this level. Oxygen has a certain property, and one of the properties that it has is that it has an attraction to other gases that have 
less electrons than it has. Right? So this is one of the properties. And hydrogen has an attraction to getting another electron. So, so it combines and it causes it to form a new substance, a new creation. Isn't it a new creation? It is. Which has a, a different set of properties. Now, what determines the properties is the laws that are in each individual thing combining to determine the law that governs the properties of the higher creation. Does that make sense? So, oxygen has a set of properties. Hydrogen has a set of properties. You mix the two sets of properties together and you get a new substance. And oxygen has a set of laws that govern it, and hydrogen has a set of laws that govern it. And if you mix those two laws together, you get a new set of laws that governs the new creation. Does that make sense? So that's how a new law is created. It's not really a new law, is it, in a way? It's really a commingling of other laws, creating new properties and new, new substances and new controls. So now we have water, which is 70% around about, isn't it, of the human body? So a lot, a lot of us, um, a lot of 70% of you, uh, of your human form, is that, right? Governed by that, governed by its properties. Okay. Now, how does that, how does H2O get into the body? Obviously, drink it goes into the digestive system. So now we have a system, so we call it the digestive system, shall we? Of which one of the elements is water. You follow me? And it also has a number of other elements, does it? Does it not? All made up from particles <coughs> relating to water. So w water combines to form cells and cells combine to form, and that all gets added to that as well. You follow? Now, all of that combined stuff that makes up the digestive system means that the digestive system now has a new set of laws governing it, which is to do with the combination of all the laws that are below it, all combining in a certain way to form the law that governs the system. Does that make sense? And then on top of that, We've got oxygen, uh, H2O has to then enter from the digestive system, has to enter the cardiovascular system. So we call that CS, just for short. Right? Now the digestive system enters that, but we've also got cell structures and everything else that forms a part of that. And all of those combined substances and combined laws add together to create a higher law which governs the cardiovascular system. You follow? So now the cardiovascular system will work the same way for each person, in the same methods for each person, given the same circumstances, the same stimuli, the same emotional controls and so forth. Of course, as soon as you change the emotional controls and change the stimuli, then of course the result is you'll get a change in the way the system works. Now that all adds up, so this all adds up to be another set of laws, this all adds up to be another set of laws, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Can you see? Making up the body. All right. And it's the way that the matter is combined, and the way that the laws combined, so when the matter combines, the laws com of that matter combine, and that's what creates the new law, and the way the matter is combined creates the new creation. Does that make sense? And it just, that goes on for the human body. That goes on right until you see the complete body. And, there's, and literally there's millions of systems that combine in all these different ways that actually finish up creating the body itself and how the body itself is able to maintain its energy able to communicate, and even how it's able to communicate with your spirit body. That's all determined as well by the way these systems work. So there is an interface that is created, which begins at the base of your spine, 
finish at the top of this base of the spine and it ends at the bottom and this interface connects you to with your with your central nervous system and the way the brain works and this interface is a way that everything it's called the silver cord it's, it's invisible to you and visible to anybody in the human form and it combines in such a way that allows communication or an interface now between this physical body and a spirit body which is similarly formed from a whole series of elements right from the base elements in a different way so the reality is there is water that forms a large part of the spirit body but it's combined in different ways than the water is combined in our physical body and this is why you can't see it right and so there's all these elemental systems that get created and therefore a whole set of laws governing that Right. Have, I, have I gone? Haven't lost it? It's all pretty, pretty straight. Yep. So, Alan, would you like to ask? Um, if a human body was created in a laboratory and there's, say, there's a lack of love on the intention of why they're creating more bodies, mm -hmm. do the laws change because the intention of the experiment? Or the laws are all the same in the human body? Well, if you, if you try to replicate the human body, you're going to have to use the same elemental systems in the same way as the human body currently is used. Therefore, the same laws will apply. Right. You see okay. what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Okay. And would the, when the ch child becomes an adult, um, even if it's been brought up by physical parents after they've come out of the laboratory, would that... Um, adult have emotions around that experiment well now see now what you're doing is you're now imposing physical stuff upon the soul and remember the two are completely separate to each other there's a whole different set of laws governing the soul uh, true yeah, yeah. So, stay on bodies yeah so this is where you got to be careful you see most of you are doing this even in your daily life you're thinking that oh your body is having a certain problem when it's actually your soul having the problem reflecting in your body uh. and things like that and this is where you start getting quite confused because you're so body centric yep right and and the trouble with being body centric is you're not understanding that the body is just an organism just like any animal based organism on the planet any mammal based organism on the planet it just has a different way in which every all the parts of it have been put together mm. that enable it to be the highest of those organisms mm. you yeah. follow yeah that's good yeah. yes yep now obviously can you see straight away too that this demonstrates that a lot of what evolution says has actually happened probably hasn't happened right the reality is things can evolve but only under governing laws and only by the way in which things commingle uh, they come together right now somebody had to define the laws that allow that to happen right because it's so complicated someone had to define the laws it's, it's an intelligent process it's not something that can happen just by chance there's so many individual systems right across the board that somebody had to create the laws that allow for the commingling of these systems so you could say evolution of the physical body is certainly possible with this however the laws that allow for that evolution to occur cannot be assumed to be happening by chance because they are highly complex and very permanent so so that indicates that while the physical body may have come from animal you know um, mammals and and slowly progressed over time somebody had to design the laws that allow the different commingling of the different of the different elements that make up the body to actually form new laws that would then allow for new creation do you see what i'm saying so so the reality is there's got to be a designer because if there wasn't none of this would be occurring right it would all be hit and miss it would all be who knows what's going to happen right so while it is possible and i'm not saying that it's what happened by the way i'm just saying that it's possible that the human form was not created directly by god in the physical the human form definitely had to be created by god directly in the soul right and god also had to formulate all of the laws that allowed for the human bodies to develop their current form at least that has to have happened 
Because if that didn't happen, there'd be no such thing as a human. Right? We'd be all animals with no free thinking, free feeling. We wouldn't be, have free will. We'd be the same as any other animal otherwise. Right? But the reality is with every animal, if you look at it, um, the commingling of the elements has to happen at the elemental level. It can't just happen from procreation. Because the genetic structure of each creature determines what it can mate with. Does that make sense? So, so for example, you can't mate a mosquito and a human and get some half mosquito, half human creature. Do you understand? Because the genetic structure, the laws that control the genetic structure of the human and the laws that control the genetic structure of the mosquito don't allow for the commingling of those two genetic structures. So it's impossible. And you, you, you can try for a mutation, it won't work. But there's other things that are, have a large amount of genetic similarity. For instance, a horse and a donkey. And what do you end up with? A mule. But can the mule reproduce? No. So, so there are some animals that have a, a large degree of genetic similarity that will allow for a commingling right, of the genetic structure, the laws, and the element at, at the elemental level, but and therefore at the replication level, but that's as far as it goes. It won't allow any other shift other than that. So there are, you, you can create mutations under certain conditions, but even the mutation is, is defined by, the mutation possibility is defined by law. You also have uh, genetic structures that, uh, so there are different types of horses, right? For example, you have some large horses, draft horses, you have other race horses that are different, like different structures. Obviously, they have a similar species-based genetic structure, therefore can commingle at the at the genetic level and therefore a new creation can come about that is a commingling of those two genetic structures. Does that make sense? But if you go beyond the law with regard to the genetic structure, you won't get you won't get a complete commingling anymore or a, or a break a uh, you know separation of the cell into two cells and fours the replication process won't occur. And as a result, you can't make some things with other things. So you can make cats with other cats, you can make dogs with other dogs, you can make horses with other horses, or even with donkeys, but you can't make a mule with another mule because it's too far gone in the replication process to be able to sustain its own commingling of the genetic structure. And the law determines that. Does that make sense? Yep. And genetic structure is a great illustration of how the law is built into the cell. This is a great illustration of how it's built in. But remember that it just drills right the way down infin into infinitesimally small, and it drills right up to the largest creation, which is the human soul creation. So everything in between is controlled in the same manner and governed in the same manner. Okay, so if we come to Jen and over to Sherry. We start with you, Sherry, because you've got the mic. Thank you. Um, so, so is there a genetic code for every individual soul? Um, so yes, like the, the soul has a genetic structure, very similar to the human body and the spirit body, but it is much, much more complicated, as you can imagine, can being the highest of God's creations. And could the, can our soul grow, like grow bigger than it was? Uh, it can only grow, it's given the potential for growth and it can only grow under certain circumstances. And the main circumstance is that it has to receive God's love and the God's love becomes a transforming part. So when we start talking about how the human soul is created, it actually has communicative abilities with God's soul. And God created it purposely f so that the human soul could have the ability to, for transformation, which we'll talk about later. But, there, but it is mathematically defined and physically defined, but it's just something that you can't see in the physical or spirit-based universes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Um, and do, does the spirit body have a genetic code separate from the physical body? Or yes, it does. 
but, but it is similar in a lot of ways and this is why when you pass, you look at your body and go, yeah, I can recognise myself. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd, be, you'd, you'd die, you pass, and you look in the mirror and you go, who's that? <laughs> I've never seen that person before, right? That's lucky. <laughs> so there are a lot of similarities, you know, um, in terms of how the bodies look. So the genetic structure of the physical body and the genetic structure of the spirit body are actually very similar to each other. But the spirit body does have, uh, is combined in different ways with the different elements that allow it to have greater capacities. Is the spirit body sort of more perfect to begin? No, perfection is defined by the soul. So, yeah. so both bodies start off at the moment of conception. Both bodies are created. There's the conception process occurs at the physical and the spiritual level at the same time. And both bodies are created. And in the moment of creation, they are perfect. It's just what happens to the emotions of the mother, the emotions of the father, and how those emotions are now absorbed by the attached soul of those two uh, cells. You know, those two cells commingle. We now have a creation. The soul attached to that creation, that's a baby. The baby's soul attaches to that creation. The baby's now become individualised. As a result of its individualization, it now has the ability to absorb, and from that moment it's absorbing. But at the moment, the very moment of creation, it's perfect. So it's a perfect reflection of our soul at the beginning. Is that what you Not say your that? soul, no. Because oh. God created the human soul. Of God's, of God's. It's a perfect creation of God at that point. Wow. The two bodies are your perfect creation at the moment of conception, but already in the conception process, your emotions are affecting both cells, so now they're going to replicate through your error. Does that make sense? Yes. So the body now is replicating through the error of its parents. But the soul is a perfect creation of God, and it starts absorbing the error of the parents. You follow? Yep. yep. Thank you. Jen? I think you might have answered my question, but my question is, um, how does love affect the system? And are you just describing a perfect system there that's not affected by anything else? Remember, love is an energy, is it not? We've yes. described it before as an energy. Yes. So remember, we've said in this description, if we go back to the description, whoops, wrong way, is, is that right? I'm going the wrong way, wrong way. Let's go back to the description. We've said that external rules affect creation's properties and energy and how the energy flows, right? And internal rules, inbuilt rules, also determine what happens to the energy flow and properties inside the creation. So, so love is an external, if we're talking about God's love now, I'm, I'm suggesting, is an external creation that has the ability to be absorbed by this, not this creation, is it? It's by God's love can only be absorbed by the soul. But remember the Dopra diagram we drew previously was the soul has energy systems that then infiltrate the spirit body and then go into the physical body. So love enters the soul and the soul's energy changes as a result of that love entering it, which then allows energy to flow through these <coughs> creations. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. That scope. Pretty nifty, hey? Yeah. Can you see that the way in which elements or genetic codes or you can see you can almost combine anything, can't you? if the law allows it, right? So, so you can combine some elements, but other elements you can't combine. The law doesn't allow it. You can combine some genetic codes, but other genetic codes don't allow it, right? You can combine digestive systems even. You, know, you take something out of a pig maybe and add it to a human and eventually it might be absorbed by the human. And, and allow the human to be part of, form a part of the digestive system, but only because of the similarities that allow it. Do you follow me? Only because of those things. It's, it's the similarities and the amount of similarity between each system that determines what is allowed and what is not allowed. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Patty, you would like to... 
Standing forward, just let me check my time as well. Yep. Does the scope then continue on beyond the human soul to um, communities of human souls and to the rest of creation? No, the human soul is the pinnacle of God's creation. So scope finishes at the human soul, but of course um, groups of human souls obviously have energy flow between them and could be considered as, you know, when a group gets together, then obviously they'll have a certain type of energy as a result of the energy that flows between them. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. so while there's no greater creation, like a group of human souls as a creation, the group of human souls have the ability to communicate with each other through the different energies, right? Remember we defined energy mm -hmm. in the definition section. As we go back to there, we define the energy including information, energy, emotion, thought, communication, relationship or interplay. The, so it involves all of those things. And those, all of those things can affect one person, but only because the one person, the soul, has had the ability to absorb those energies. Okay. Does that make sense? And can those energies be the ant or the tree too? Yep. Okay. Yep. Anything up to a human soul. Okay. And, and beyond, because you can actually absorb part of God's feelings. God designed your soul to absorb God's feelings. So, so you can actually start absorbing God's feelings. That's how you become divine. Okay. Make sense? Thank you. Yep. Shula, just be straight behind. I just wanted to clarify something that you said a minute ago, mm -hmm. um, that the soul can't get bigger without God. So can mm. the soul ex expand with natural love or is it just with God's love? No, uh, it, it, the soul in its natural love state can only expand beyond the sixth dimension. And that, that sixth dimension, as you'll learn, is a very minor part of the universe um, because it's only, well, you know, we're going to, we, I can start introducing other principles if you like, but... Um, <clears throat> you can see with the spheres that they're concentric, really. One includes the other, includes the other, includes the other, includes the other, and so forth. Obviously, with different laws, each time it includes the other sphere. Same as this is happening, so too the spheres are happening. At the sixth sphere, the soul has the can only stop there. That's where God created the sixth sphere, the, the soul to be, in that sphere. So you could say that's God's first sphere, isn't it, really? That's... That's the natural human place. That's where God created the soul without God's love. Any progress beyond that requires God's love to enter the soul. Otherwise, the soul can't exist in the new location. And it's God's love that changes the way things commingle. So the creation of the new spheres are dictated by the soul's progression and God's love and the way that that interacts with the soul's progression. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. But that's not even one universe yet. <laughs> one universe is, well, so where you could say one universe involves 36 of those in getting into the union state, then you're in a new universe. And the way the universes get together is different again, so we'll talk about that maybe later. <laughs> but, um, but it's all the same principle in scope. Uh, scope determines all that. Scope determines how the spheres exist, even in the same way of how your body exists and how cells exist and everything. Scope, are the laws that govern scope are these laws. that They're incredibly complex, as you can imagine, um, and incredibly amazing in terms of the fact that they have this ability to have rules inside of the creation and external rules co that come from a combination of the other creations outside of the creation working together to create something new. It's just an amazing concept. Um, and the more you learn about it, the more you appreciate how much design had to go into it for it to happen. It also scope forms the basis of hierarchy, governance, compensation and uh, responsibility principles. So without scope, those other principles couldn't really exist. Right? So, so this is a very important principle uh, from a fundamental as a fundamental principle goes, because it, 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 is, it is the most complex principle in terms of how creation gets made and is governed. Mm. So it's a very powerful set of principles, as you can imagine. 
Um, and I don't know if you've ever, uh, those of you who might have tried programming, the so-called object-oriented programming is, is it, it sort of contains some of the philosophy of this kind of principles. Does that make sense? For those of you who are programmers or have tried object-oriented programming. Um, everything is an object that has properties or methods, methods being processes. And so you have properties, which are these things, properties affecting energy, affecting the potentials, affecting the, uh, you know, what things look like, and then it has energy or, or what it does, you know, processes that it can, is able to complete. Oh, sorry. My computer, what's powering off? My TV is powering off because I've stayed on the same screen for too long. Press any key to cancel. There we go. Okay. Still getting a screen, shouldn't do that, but okay. Some of the laws involved in man's creation seem sort of a bit <laughs> unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Felix, you'd like to ask? I'm um, a bit over time, but I said I'd go 10 minutes tonight, and I am. Um, I'm um, 10 minutes, so this is our last question. So the scope principle, what you're saying is then, the scope principle is the one that guarantees there's, there's no chaos. And it, is it also s then that um, when humans attempt to make chaos, mm -hmm. um, that, that means there's also... There's a limit to the chaos they can create, yes. Yeah, but does it also mean that um, where there's a lack of love, there's also then... A, a tendency towards entropy or chaos? No, um, because chaos is not possible. God's designed it in the law that chaos is not completely possible. So, yeah, but does it mean that um, like more love means more order, and less love means a, a you know a, a, a lessening of yeah, order I understand what and you're more saying. entropy? Um, it does at the human soul level, certainly. Okay. But uh, in terms of the physical laws, it doesn't really affect the physical laws very yeah, much because yeah. they all That's are under yeah. God's authority, yeah, yeah. not under man's authority. And this is why we have to have the authority discussion. Does that make sense? Because yeah. uh, the authority discussion determines what you are able to control as a human and what God actually is going to maintain control of yeah. and what he's going to let you have control of. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. But it, then it, does it also mean that when, um, when humans... Uh, try to create chaos, scope principle means that the effect will always be unloving, is that right? Uh, the effect will always be unloving, but, uh, but also the effect will always be limited. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Does that make sense? Because yeah, yeah. the laws it themselves does. will yep. cause order to reappear. And that's, that's because of the scope principle? Yes. Yep. Okay, yes. thank you. Yep. And, uh, and others, other principles too. Obviously, the scope principle forms the basis, as I said, for the order-based principles. So there are lots of other principles that are involved in the process of limiting the human soul's ability to create anarchy in the universe. And it's only really the human soul that desires it. There's no other creature that desires anarchy because they don't, no other creature has desire. Right? They only have instinctual behaviours. Um, so the human soul has desire, so it's the only part of the creation that can create anything that's out of harmony with God's creations. And, and God allows you to have control over the things you create that are out of harmony with what God creates. But, but even that is limited to a fair degree by these other laws that govern the fact that you're using some of God's materials to create. And anything that is using God's materials to create naturally is going to be governed by God's sense of order. So there's a limit to how far you can go in terms of what you can create. Does that make sense? And of course, as you approach or receive more and more of God's love, what happens is that the, your limitations of creation are removed. Because now you, you've received more and more of God's love, therefore that you are more and more in harmony with God's love, and therefore your creations are going to be in harmony with God's love, so there's no need for as much restriction. So you start creating things all in harmony with God's love that are less restrictive. Anyway, that's starting to get... I think, I think I've started to lose everybody there. Anyway... <laughs> um, 
So, so you can see that not only is it right down to the smallest particle level, this process, but right up to how the spheres are created, how the universe is all fit together, everything is all determined the same way. You can imagine, just to make a universe, how many laws and how many creations there must be involved in that, and how, therefore how that all those laws come together. Uh, obviously very, very complicated, because there's so many of them, billions of them, literally, billions of them exist. Um, it, even in your human body, there are literally billions of laws that are built into your human body. That, and, I've, and it would be probably more accurate to say billions of billions, just in the human body alone. And the human body is not the most complex creation. The soul is. Right? So, yeah. It's pretty fascinating, really how it all works. Anyway, what we'll do is we'll just uh, change over for a minute and then we'll have a bit more of a Q&A on the subject and I'll try to answer some of the other questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, do our Q&A, scope principles Q&A now. So let's go across to Hunter who's got a question about inbuilt rules. As we progress, do our inbuilt rules change? Um, the answer to that question is no, they don't change. Remember, laws create possibilities as well as current states. So, so as you progress, you start engaging the possibilities of the laws rather than actually the laws changing or the inbuilt rules changing. What's actually happening is you're now engaging or possibly can, can now possibly engage those new facets of that law that you have previously been ignoring. Now, there is a, the exception to that, and that is the transformation of the human soul, which actually does add capacities to the human soul, but even the possibility of the transformation, receiving God's love, being the, the, the causal reason for the transformation, even the capacity for the human soul to receive God's love has been already inbuilt in the soul itself. So therefore, it's not the law changing, uh, or the inbuilt rule of the soul changing. It's just the rule existing that we weren't aware of and now we become aware and we engage it and now it en engages an inflow of love that then allows transformation of the soul itself. Does that make sense? So, so the reality is that uh, the majority of it is happening, uh, all of it is really happening because the inbuilt rules have been, and particularly for the soul this is, being the most highest of God's creations, therefore the most complex, it has already got inbuilt in it so many things already that, uh, that, that we just need to learn how to engage in order to actually benefit from. Yeah. So for, for the majority of us on earth, we are barely touching our soul and barely touching its capacity because we're not aware of its capacity and therefore not experimenting with its p potentials. Yeah. Yep. Does that answer? Yep. Okay, if we go across to Patty. All four. All four, no, just, uh, well, actually, let's see. Just the first one, Patty, if that's all right. Okay. Yep. Um, is scope like an infinite nest of concentric circles that is all creation? Uh, what do you mean by that is all creation? Because I, I like is scope an infinite net of concentric circles. As you can see, that's basically what it is. That forms all creation, that, that encompasses? I, I, yeah. Well, God encompasses all creation. So you could say God is the highest scope. Okay. Right? Remember, God being the infinite being contains all creation. And then everything that's inside of God is obviously less you know, when it comes to things like this, like the universe and stuff, well, that depends on how we progress as to how those things get created. So um, when you say all creation, see, I, I suppose I have a philosophical and, and a uh, logical problem with the term all creation because there is really no such thing as all creation because new things are being created all the time. So what you say is all creation right now in five minutes' time, won't be all creation. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's a, com a constantly expanding proposition towards in the infinite, God being the infinite. Okay. 
Okay. So, you know, who knows what the potentials are? Oh, I feel we're still, we're only, you know, in the physical universe, they, you know, they've tried to age it back to, what is it, anywhere from 9 to 15 or 16 billion years old or so. But to, that's just sort of like in time, that's sort of like a drop in the bucket in terms of time of, as to what the potentials may be. Because mm -hmm. what basically God is saying is if once you've received God's love, you become an immortal being. Immortal beings means that your future time is infinite. So this is one of the beauties of what God's done is God's given us with regard to when we receive God's love, we receive from God as a part of that love the prospect of infinite time. Mm -hmm. right? So we're actually receiving one of God's actual, actual qualities into the soul itself, right? Infinite yeah. time. Yeah. Infinite time. And there is the potential that as we receive other qualities from God that we may have things like infinite space, infinite, you know, who knows what those infinite things will be mm -hmm. as to what those potentials may mean. But, but it's a process of growing and it might occur over billions of years. Mm. Mm. Yep. Obviously over an infinite amount of time. Okay. Anything is really possible in, in regard to the way God's created the system. Yeah. 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 But it is, uh, you can see that it, the, the, you sort of have, un you could almost liken it to each new creation. So in the case, if we go back to the H2O, the water discussion, you can see that oxygen is obviously made up of a whole heap of, heap of sub subatomic particles. Hydrogen is made up of a whole heap of subatomic particles. The way they are combined forms the element. The element has specific properties because of the way the underlying particles are combined and the same forms with oxygen because of the way the underlying particles are combined. Oxygen has specific properties. So that has specific properties and energy flow, so does hydrogen, and it has a specific set of laws governing that particular thing. And when we add them both together, we now get a new set, a new a new material, which is a combination of the olds, along with a new set of laws that govern that new material in that state. Right? But that can be pulled apart, just like the human body can be pulled apart, down to its underlying states. So H2O can be broken down to hydrogen and oxygen again, and it will go back to what its original laws and the original properties were that governed it when it was a gas. Mm -hmm instead of a liquid. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So, so it works in reverse as well as forward in terms of the, the way things are destroyed and, and reutilized, as well as the way things are created. Yeah. And because God's soul is this energy measuring system, mm -hmm. then the laws become what tracks all that energy. Yes, and, and you could almost <laughs> think of God's... See, this is why in the like, pageant messages we refer to God's soul as the oversoul because it contains everything else. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why it's called the oversoul. God is the oversoul of the universe uh, and, and of all potential universes, in fact. Because remember that the way these things are created is that there are the potential of other universes being created depending on how things commingle, how things are pulled together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty amazing, huh? You had to be pretty clever to come up with that, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing system. And I, I just love too how it can be broken down and elements reused yeah. in a different chain. So like when oxygen is broken down into its subatomic particles, those subatomic particles can commingle and form another element, not oxygen. It's just the way they formed as what, what determines how, what element it will form. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, a, a, it's a very powerful system allowing for... It's sort of like a building block system, if you can think of it like that, isn't it? With all these different building materials. And you put the building materials together in a different way and you get a different result each time. Yeah. Yeah. If we go straight back to Tristan... And Dennis over here. 
Thanks, Tris. So what you're, um, what you're saying, and when we learn how to create in the spirit world and as um, in the celestial spheres, we use this uh, law a lot to, to put these building blocks together to make our new creations. Correct. So that's what one of the things. And in the uh, Robert James Lee's book, there is an example of that when the lady is trying to teach them how to make a piece of grass. Right? And all they're doing is coming to understand how these different elemental systems form together to combine in a certain way to form that grass and therefore form the laws that control that grass. Does that make sense? And, and this is something that is happening. Even children do this in the spirit world. So this is like, so, so, from, so uh, I, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> on, on, earth, on earth, we have a very rudimentary understanding that even a small child, you know, four or five years old, has already exceeded our understanding when it comes to this kind of thing because they are open to the concept because they're not limited by the human emotional concepts and ideas that govern you know, what matter is and how matter is controlled and how matter is created and how laws are governed and so forth. They're not, you know, the children are open to all of those things, so naturally they can be taught things in a practical way. You know, they don't know all the mathematics involved, but they do know how will and desire control it. Yeah. So this is a w another loving thing that God has done. And we was talk when we talk about will and desire, it's another very loving thing God has done because will and desire control a lot of this stuff. You, the pinnacle of God's creation, need to learn how to use your will and desire. Right? And that's what controls these things. Now, children in the spirit world, yeah, they've learnt that from a pretty young age. They don't have the limitations anymore of the parents' belief systems and the parents' emotions and all those things anymore imposed upon them. So naturally, they can be taught things that far exceed our earth-based current understanding levels. Yeah. Um, who else had their hand up? You had uh, Bruce had your hand up, and Dennis. We're going to Dennis next. So. As we sin, mm -hmm. our body then creates a chemical reaction, which creates new new matter to change this structure to cause disease. There are chemical reactions in the body that occur as we sin, but only because of the change in the energy systems in the soul. Because the soul is the thing. Right that is the measuring instrument of the sin. So, so the soul sins, it has a new emotional state, a new condition of love as a result of its state. That new emotional state affects the two bodies, both the spirit one and the physical one. Yeah. So the spirit body enters new chemical processes and the physical body enters new chemical and energetic system processes. And as a result, those bodies degrade. Right, yeah. And therefore, the replication process of the cells no longer works properly and so forth. So you get an ageing effect and so forth. And that's all a part of the process of the, the sin of the soul and the way the sin of the soul affects the flow of energy in the soul back into the bodies. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Thank yep. you. Chris? Um, my question is about um, genetic... Um Manipulation? Yeah, it was, but I, was, <laughs> I dropped that one. Yeah. Imperfections and um, things like that, are yep. they held in the soul or are they held? Or are they just expressed in the physical body? The, the genetic uh, imperfections, if we can call them that, which are in the physical body are a result of something that's in the soul and the way in which the soul's energy was flowing. And many of them come from the time in gestation, from the time of conception to the time of birth. What's happening in that area of time, if you, if you knew how much effect as parents you were having on your children during that phase, most of you would either stop having children or until you fix the problem, um, you'd probably choose to do that, stop having children until you fix the problem. But, but the reality is what happens is remember even the sperm and the egg, because they come from imperfect parents who have imperfect soul conditions and have imperfect spirit bodies and have imperfect physical bodies, those, the sperm and the egg themselves, which it consists of two, sub, two elements, one is a spiritual element and the other is a physical element, <laughs> when they combine, you, you get the effect of the imperfections in, genetic imperfections in those two elements combining along with the emotional impact 
that the new soul now has to experience from the parents that it's now associated with combining, which, which as you can imagine, is quite severe yeah. in comparison to God's condition of love. And as a result of that combination, <coughs> the sin of the parent is now visited on the child. So taking that to the next stage, can the child, in this case, um, uh, because there's that what they call what genetic dispositions and things like that. So can they, in their human body, yes, um, correct that? Of course, but it requires correction at the soul level. So you can't actually physically correct the body without correcting the soul. If you attempt to physically correct the body, so for example, let's say you start getting lines around your face and your eyes and everything, so you go to have a tuck, right? <laughs> and you pull out and they stretch out your skin and you look young again. The reality is the soul still has the condition that's creating that problem and so the soul is still going to create old age no matter what you do about it and unless you deal with the cause of the reason why it's doing that in the end your physical body is going to die anyway and it will probably die just as fast as it was always going to die. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, So this is where you've got to get away from trying to change everything at the physical level because you are not a physical being so you've got to stop this whole process of trying to change everything at a physical level and start addressing the soul-based issues that create problems. Yeah. So I'm not saying that uh, you might not try to extend your life because and, and by changing a physical thing. What I'm suggesting is every physical thing that causes you a problem, if it's not addressed at the soul level, at the end, in the end it's not addressed. So it's going to continue to have the same effect. Yeah. A good sign is when you start um, when you start waking up in the morning and you notice that you look younger, not permanently, but just in the morning. That's a good sign that your soul condition is now starting to exceed your physical condition. Does that make sense? During the course of the day, it may return back to it's. But every morning you wake up and you're looking a bit younger. That's an indication that that there is some improvement in your soul condition, uh, particularly if, if you're aged you, and you can see the improvement when you get up in the morning, then you notice that, well, there must be some soul condition improvement. I've just got to keep working on it for it to be permanent. Yeah. Remember, physical body changes take up to seven years to, to be reflected from your soul. So, you know, you might fix something today and you might only see the results seven years' time. Uh, in your physical form. Mm. Of course that's different. Once you hit a one minute with God, then you're perfect. Every, everything happens instantly after then. So, yeah. Um, Robert, are we up to? Or was there someone over here? No? Robert. And I'm... Um, ten, just a bit check. Just ten, ten. I've got... I'll do five minutes and then... Okay. In the notes, it says that... Um, uh, scope principles reveal that God wanted all devolution to result in further creation. Yes. I can understand that in physical and things, but how does that apply to the soul? If the soul's in the state of devolution, you're going backwards. Um, well, when I talk about devolution there, um, we're talking not about devolution in condition. So you, you can see with the soul, it's a conditional thing. It's based on condition. Whereas with the other, with devolution of other things, it is based on the breakup of of things where matter is being affected in a in a in a breakdown effect, if you like. Um, but the the reality is, the soul does do. You can devolve your soul, mm. uh, but but not dissolve your soul. So it's important to not confuse the two the two terms. Okay. A devolution of soul is a devolution in condition. Is your, is a devolvement in condition. And that will certainly have many effects, um, and but not all of them are negative, because as your soul devolves, you notice it. There's extra pain, and that causes you then to go, "Do I want to continue this process of devolution?" So, so you can't say that even the devolution process is all just negative in its effect, because in reality, is it might cause awareness that you didn't have before. So that is a positive effect. That'll kick off a desire to 
go the other way. Exactly, mm. exactly. So even with devolution of the soul, you can't say it's all negative mm. because it can have a positive effect on you. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, frequently is the only thing that has a positive effect for most people, right? You, where they feel themselves going down, down and down and then they get to the point of so much pain, they go, I want to stop this pain. Yep. Now that's the turning point, the decision of turn, mm. the turning point of desire. And as you'll learn later in the uh, discussion that if will and desire are the same, you won't change. Desire has to be different to will before you'll change. So, so what, what, to, what the soul does is it devolves down to a point where it's in so much pain and then it goes, I want to change. <laughs> I want to change. And that is a good thing, isn't it? To actually reach that yeah. conclusion. Mm. So, so it's actually a positive thing, <laughs> even if it if it does happen. Now, I'm not saying it's a good thing for you to do purposefully. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a positive thing that it it's, happens it's that way. It's what most of us do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Uh, um, it, it's just a positive thing in that we do it purposefully, we devolve because we think we're doing the right thing, we devolve and we get to the so state of so much pain and then we go, hang on a sec, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing and that's the point of change where my desire now changes. Now I have the pr prospect of evolving mm. as a soul and and that's a good thing. So you, can you say that the desire was born from, it was really born from the pain that came from the devolution, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's great that God's created this compensatory system. And as we learn in the order principles, you can see how all the order principles work in order to correct us, to bring us back into happiness and harmony, okay. even though we decide differently. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, it's, uh, I'm about a few minutes over, um, so I think we probably need to stop there or stop around that point. Um, it, can you see how fascinating scope is? <laughs> really fascinating. Um, we, myself and Mary had days of discussion about scope as we were preparing. In fact, myself and Mary have had many, <laughs> a lot uh, more interesting discussions that we've had with you <laughs> at this stage uh, about these subjects. Um, so, so understand that we're just again scratching the surface of these particular principles, but uh, you can see from discussion that man is sort of uh, pretty amazing. And it, and the the more we talk about different things, the more amazing it gets, doesn't it? It's like you start off feeling fairly amazed, and then it just gets more amazing. And what I love about scope principles, though, it is a fundamental principle because it's the fundamental building block of the universe, right, this principle, fundamental wielding block of the universe, there is so much truth in it and so much love in it because it allows not only, it allows for new creations to come into existence and still be governed by law. So there's no disorder. So you just can't just go haphazardly creating something and then that thing you just created destroys the whole universe. <laughs> you know, you, you can't do that with these principles. God's, uh, God's laws prevent those things from happening. And that's a remarkable thing too, if you think about it. That shows huge amounts of forethought on God's part. And, and also the potential that it means, that just understanding the principle means you can start to see the potentials, you see. You can start going, wow, I've been thinking of this universe very, in a very limited way, right? I've been thinking of my own experience in a limited way, the universe in a limited way, thinking of God in a limited way, thinking that everything's quite, you know, small, when it's infinitely large, of course, because it always contained within the infinitely large oversoul of the universe. Mm. Good stuff, huh? Mm. Yeah. All right, well, what we're going to do now is uh, Mary is going to come up uh, after the break and she's going to do a review of the eight principles that we've discussed and also of the one discussion or two discussions we've had, fundamental facts and the human law comparison. So as you can imagine, Mary has 10 different subjects to cover in 50 minutes, plus give you some homework in that time. <laughs> so it's going to be... a Pretty rapid fire review of what we've discussed. But uh, if we have a break now, come back at 20 past and, uh, and get started on the review. Thanks, guys. <laughs>